Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our talk this evening um, from the Yorkshire Centre of the Royal Neurological Society. Um, there still seems to be a few people coming in, so I'm just going to wait a minute and let everyone arrive. Um, but I can already see we've got lots of attendees from all over the place. Um, I think Gordon from Nebraska is our most international visitor so far. So it looks like um, most people have arrived now. Um, my name is Sarah Barr, and I'm chairing the event this evening. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Climate and Atmospheric Science at the University of Leeds. Um, I've also got Ben Pickering in the background, that some of you will know from our last talk um, as co-chair. So if there's any technical problems or anything like that, um, he'll take over. And uh, he's also going to keep an eye um, on the chat um, and any questions that come in. Um, if you haven't joined one of our virtual meetings before, just give a quick rundown of how it's going to work. Um, so we're going to have a talk about 30 minutes um, and then 15 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, and you'll have noticed that you don't have any video or audio, but you do have a chat, which is already quite busy. Um, so you can put questions in the chat um, and you can write in there at any point during the talk um, with your question. Um, and then at the end, we'll go through these questions and I'll um, ask, ask our speaker. Um, and also, if you have any, you know, any tech problems or anything, um, you can write in the chat and we'll try and do with those. Um, this talk is also going to be recorded um, and that will be available on YouTube after the meeting. Um, I think that covers all the admin. So I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for this evening, which is Professor Ian Brooks from the University of Leeds. Um, Ian, if you want to put your video on, you go. So Ian did an undergraduate degree in pure and applied physics at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, he stayed on to study for a PhD in thunderstorm electrification processes. Following this, he spent eight years working at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at the University of California at San Diego, first as a postdoc uh, and then as an associate project scientist studying various problems in marine boundary layer meteorology, including marine fatigumulus, radar ducting, and air sea interruptions. Uh, most of this was based on aircraft measurements. Then in 2002, Ian moved to Leeds, initially as a university research, university research fellow. His work here has continued to focus on boundary layer processes, ocean atmosphere interactions, and Arctic meteorology and climate. Uh, and all this was based on measurements in the field, mostly from ships. He spent an average of about five weeks a year at sea, accumulating approximately 16 months over the last 15 years. Uh, and this, this evening, Ian's going to talk um, about Mosaic, which is his longest trip to date, where he spent 104 days at sea. So I think we're in for a really interesting talk. And over to you, Ian. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Okay, hope you can see those slides. Uh, I see a number of old friends uh, are signed in here. So hello to everybody that I actually know. Um, and the title of this talk, I said, was A Year of Measurements in the Arctic Sea Ice, which is maybe um, slightly having false pretenses in that I wasn't actually there for a whole year, although the expedition ran for um, a little bit, just over <clears throat> a year in the end. Um, I was initially, well, I spent long, longer in a way than expected. I um, was supposed to be out on the first setup period of Mosaic, which was in uh, September into October uh, 2019. And I was supposed to be out there for uh, a few weeks and then come back on the support ship and then go back out again in uh, February of last year for leg three so the the campaign split into six two month long legs of measurements with approximately two weeks of transit on a support ship either side of each leg um and to so one of the the 
things of a project like this, things can go uh, wrong. And what went wrong this time was five days before I was supposed to leave, one of my colleagues, Andreas, from the University of Trier in Germany, who I was working very closely with to do joint measurements, uh, slipped on an icy staircase outside the ship and broke his leg. And he got sent home on the support ship since he was going to be in plaster for six weeks. And I ended up staying unexpectedly uh, through till Christmas, um, which was um, caused a certain amount of chaos trying to reorganize my teaching, etc., back home uh, with only about 48 hours notice. So um, Mosaic is the largest field campaign that has ever been conducted in the Arctic. It's absolutely huge. And its focus is on the multidisciplinary processes that control Arctic climate. A little bit of background of the science for you here um, is the Arctic, I'm sure most of you are familiar, is warming faster than the rest of the world, about twice as fast as the global mean rate of warming, which you've seen here. And in particular, it's really accelerated this. Uh, the middle plot shows here. Um, the uh, acceleration, the warming that happened in the late 1990s. Uh, and it's not really understood exactly why that acceleration took place. And the second problem we have in trying to predict what will happen into the future is that climate models uh, show their largest uncertainty in the Arctic. So um, this figure shows the range of uncertainties um, from a whole pile of different climate models and you can see that that uncertainty is much larger um, in the Arctic north of about um, 70 or 80 degrees north. Um, it's a factor of two to three larger than it is in anywhere in the middle latitudes and at least double what it is in the Antarctic region. And uh, this is due to uh, problems in representing um, processes that are specific to the Arctic environment. Um, we don't necessarily understand which processes are not being um, handled well. And part of that is due to a simple lack of measurements. Most of the processes in climate models that are parameterized, those parameterizations are based on measurements where it is relatively easy and cheap to make measurements, which is pretty much anywhere except the Arctic. So there are very few measurements in this uh, region on which to even test existing parameterizations, never mind develop new process understanding and develop parameterizations that are applicable to the Arctic conditions. So Mosaic was designed to tackle this problem. Um, it's the first major sort of year long expedition since the late 90s when the Americans ran a campaign called Sheba, which spent 11 months uh, frozen into the ice on the Canadian side of the Arctic. There have been a couple of sh smaller scale um, expeditions that have done uh, drifts across the Arctic. So uh, there was an ex um, expedition with the, the Tara expedition uh, a few years ago, but those are much, much smaller scale and, and making a, a much smaller range of measurements. Um, Mosaic started as a driven by the atmospheric science community. So Matthew Shoup at NOAA in, in Boulder, Colorado is the real driving force behind getting this going. Um, <clears throat> but it's very clear that you can't understand climate just in terms of atmospheric processes, just the meteorology. You need to include a lot of other factors. So it is coupled closely to sea ice processes, to ocean uh, dynamics and ocean biogeochemistry, which relate to gas exchange and potentially production of aerosol particles at the surface. Those aerosol particles are strong controlling factors on cloud. The clouds are the strongest control on the surface radiation budget, which is the largest component of the energy budget. And so if you get those wrong in a model, <clears throat> then you basically get almost everything else wrong as well. So Mosaic aimed to tackle this and to study as many different components of the climate system as we could. Uh, it's been a long time in the planning. My first uh, involvement was in 2011, when the very first meeting to try and uh, start to spin this program up took place. 
So that is um, eight years from first planning meeting to the expedition actually taking place. Um, a lot of that problem part of it is the sort of science planning, what exactly do we want to do, getting the right things involved. Um, but a, a lot of effort um, and the, the stumbling block, the real showstopper is getting somebody to commit a ship for a whole year, an icebreaker. And there are a relatively small number of ships that would be capable of doing this. And when RV Germany committed to the Polar Stern, then that was the point where suddenly everything kicked into high gear and it was definitely going to happen. So for the rest of the talk, I'm not going to go into details of the science very much, but more the, the process of the expedition, what it's what sort of measurements we were making and what it's like to try and do this in the Arctic. So this is the Polar Stern, the ship we were based on. Uh, this is uh, as we were entering the sea ice um, in September, late September 2019. Um, we took, the first thing we have to do is find a large stable ice flow somewhere um, on the um, Russian side of the poles. We expect we we're gonna drift with the ice and the mean drift is uh, across the Arctic from the Pacific side towards the Atlantic side. So we want to initially freeze in as far away from the point where we are drifting to as possible. Um, and so we, we headed round to the um, Russian side, the Siberian side of the, the Arctic Ocean, entered the ice and started to look for a flow. So these here, this is all very small broken up ice near the ice edge. Uh, we were accompanied by a Russian icebreaker, the uh, academic Fedorov, which was also searching for flows and had additional uh, staff. So we had a much larger team for the initial setup than could stay on the Polish stern. And the, the Fedorov was also responsible for deploying around the central observatory where the Polish stern was moored. Um, an array of distributed measurement sites. So some really simple things like GPS buoys, which gave information on the larger scale uh, drift and deformation of the sea ice, um, a few energy balance stations um, and so on. So they, they spent um, a couple of weeks deploying a wide range of uh, distributed monitoring stations around the center of the um, uh, expedition which was where the Polish stern froze in. So a lot of work was done with helicopter going out and surveying ice flows trying to find one that is is large enough and stable enough and this actually proved really difficult. The ice conditions were very poor, um, there were not very many large old ice flows so a lot of it was first year ice relatively thin uh, but eventually we did find this flow um, which you can see, um, I'm not sure, can you actually see my mouse pointer? Um, have I got a way of pointing at things on here? Um, okay, I will describe then. So on the, uh, about the halfway, vertically halfway and two thirds across this image, you can just about make out the pole stern moored into a, uh, a crack. Uh, in the ice and everything on the left is a large ice flow that is um, uh, a couple of kilometers across. Um, the, um, the angle of view here is a little bit uh, misleading. It is a, a relatively sizable ice flow and it was the, the largest, thickest, most stable thing that we could find, um, which is um, worrying in a way. This is, is actually not a large stable flow of the sort that we had really hoped to have. Um, this is a map that was um, set up to give guidance as to where everything was as we changed teams. Um, the underlying map is a, a LIDAR mapping of the ice, which is done from helicopter. Um, the red lines on here are tracks that were laid out. These are basically um, skidoo tracks that we, we always try to stay on well-defined routes, which we know are safe, that have been surveyed. We know we're not gonna go over any um, thin ice and fall through. And also because we don't want to disturb much of the ice and snow surface. There are a lot of measurements going on of the ice itself and snow accumulation on it. And those 
areas for sampling need to be kept maintained as clean as possible and as undisturbed as possible. Um, and the, uh, the meteorological measurements, you can see here uh, about a third of the way up the image and about just off the center line is a little site called Met, which is the, the Met city. So a lot of the, the measurements coming out from the polar stern were strung out along a line with the meteorological measurements at the far end of the line where we were as would experience as little distortion of the airflow we were sampling as possible. Um, there's a close up of that. Um, so you can see the, the Met site just um, to the right of this region that's called the outer wall. So um, this area labeled the fortress was in a region of very rough convoluted ice with a lot of ridging. Um, the names for things like the fortress and the sculpture garden and tall block are just things, features that, that people gave names to that make it easier to refer to um, roughly where someone is going or what they're doing or directions for things. Um, so that on the left is what it looked like when we started. Um, partway through leg one, there was a major distortion of the ice and there was a big crack formed in front of the ship that's given by this white dotted line on the right hand image and everything to below that line started to move. Um, this was late one night, um, we all watched this from up on the bridge and everything moved by about half a kilometer um, so that all our nicely laid out routes to things all got messed up, uh, nothing was where we had left it um, and it also caused a lot of problems and we've got power cables and data cables and things strung out which all got ripped up and broken uh, and this happened more than once it was the ice was a lot more dynamic than people were really expecting um, just for fun this is an infrared image uh, taken from the helicopter again that shows um, the temperature uh, range here is um, about minus uh, 40 to minus 34 and a half, something like that. So a little over five degree temperature range. So we see that the, the leads broken water stands out quite clearly as hot spots. The ship stands out and everything else is pretty cold. Um, <clears throat> so some of the measurements that were being made, um, these are uh, around the, the central meteorological site is a, a mass that's shown on the right there. Uh, this is doing turbulent flux measurements by eddy covariance technique. Uh, there was a lot of gas flux measurements being made. So the, these are, are both radiatively active gases, so CO2, methane, and gases like methane and DMS, dimethyl sulfide, that are related to biological processes, um, and things like ozone, which are very important for oxidation chemistry that's going on. So these were mostly made by um, a team from the US, um, from uh, Boulder and the, uh, the Bigelow uh, Observatory for um, Marine Science. Um, so a couple of colleagues of mine, Byron Blomquist and Steve Archer were responsible for these. Um, to the bottom left, there's a non-turbulent measurement of the flux. This is this cone that's put on the ice surface is being pumped through with, with clean filtered air going into it and then being pumped out and through a mass spectrometer to measure the gas exchange through the surface. Um, and initially during this winter period, they basically could say that the, the gas fluxes were essentially zero, but they could measure that they were zero more precisely than anybody had ever done before. Then as we move into the spring when biology kicks off, they started to measure uh, more significant fluxes. Aerosols I mentioned are very important for cloud processes. So there were a huge number of aerosol measurements being made, mostly in a couple of container labs on the ship, but also um, some mobile equipment being taken out onto the ice and left to sample. So the system at the bottom right there that's being, being set up is a, a measurements of ice nucleating particles. These are aerosol that can directly allow ice crystals to form. That's something that we know very little about in the Arctic. We don't really know what the chemistry is, where they come from. Um, so this was set up um, system to measure near openly. So when a lead opened up in the ice, this system was taken out to measure to see if there were any ice nucleating particles 
being generated at the water surface and making it into the air. Um, cloud properties, huge array of measurements here, uh, multiple cloud radar, uh, we have multiple LIDARs, um, scanning microwave radiometers, um, some uh, measurements of precipitation, particles at surface, direct measurements of fog and ice crystals near the surface. Um, it's the largest array of, of um, cloud measurements, again, that's ever been made within the uh, Arctic Ocean. Uh, the only comparable measurement suites would have been made around the, the Arctic Rim on um, particularly in um, Alaska sites have been set up. <clears throat> now getting to the stuff that I'm more closely involved in is turbulence measurements. This is a 12 by 11 meter mast um, that was built by uh, colleagues in Boulder, uh, NOAA, and this is instrumented for turbulent flux measurements at three levels. So there is a uh, temperature, uh, three dimensional uh, high rate wind measurements that's measured at 20 hertz. There are mean temperature and relative humidity measurements or mean wind speed measurements, um, measurements of uh, blowing snow particles on here from the British Antarctic Survey. Um, and inlets to gas sampling for uh, gas fluxes. Um, then this gets measurements of the, the near the surface. So boundary layer processes, most of the, the changes take place very close to the surface. So we need a high density of measurements there. Um, in the Arctic, we very often get very shallow boundary layers or surface-based inversion. And it's interesting to push the measurements up as high as we can um, so 12 meters is sort of okay, but getting up a little higher helps. Um, so we also have um, a 30 meter mast that come, this is one of my contributions, comes from Leeds. Um, and this is actually a mast designed for the military for putting up um, radio antennas in the field. Um, the, the instruction manual says it can be put up in about an hour and a half with a team that know what they're doing. Doing it in the Arctic under somewhat less than ideal conditions took about two days. Um, but it's a very effective way of getting measurements up to 30 meters. So here we have another set of turbulent flux and mean temperature and humidity measurements right at the top. Um, then this is a photograph of us uh, putting it up. Um, so it's made up of, of tubular sections about a meter and a half long that fed in at the bottom and then winched up and they locked together and you can pull the winch block down, put another section in, push it up, uh, adjusting guy lines uh, as you go. Um, it's quite a challenge to do this. This was done in the dark, uh, temperatures of about minus 20 to minus 25. Um, so dealing with any of those small nuts and bolts and cable ties and things like that is an absolute nightmare because you will get you can't take gloves off for very long or you get frostbite um this then is a wider view of the meteorological what we call met city uh, there's a hut built this is a, a wooden hut um built on the right that's where data logging systems go that's heated to just above freezing, try to maintain it at about five degrees C because one of the chemistry instruments that is running is water cooled and needs to be kept above freezing point, which is um, an exciting challenge in these conditions. And then in the middle where all the green light is, that's um, a system for getting video imaging of snowballs that are falling. So that is a, an experiment that is looking at the morphology of ice crystals and snow particles. Right in the foreground, there is something just sticking up out of the snow. So this is actually an oceanographic measurement. Um, it's got an ocean, uh, I think that's got an ocean profiling system hanging below it. So it's measuring uh, the near surface structure of the upper ocean. There are also turbulent flux measurements uh, embedded within these, these uh, buoys that are, are stuck down into the ice to get uh, the energy flux on the underside of the ice as well as the measurements that we're making on the upper side of the ice so we can get a, a complete energy balance for the ice. Um, when installing this stuff, I should note, we had to survey the area for where we wanted to put things out. So where this mast goes up, 
Um, we want this to last hopefully for a whole year. So we want reasonably thick ice to put it on and it was hard to find something really thick. And this is actually installed on a tongue of thicker ice that goes out into quite thick ice. Um, to measure the ice thickness, you just get a, an ice drill, it's about 50 millimeters across, drill down through the ice and then drop a, a basically a tape measure with a weight on the end so you can measure how thick the ice is. Um, and while doing that and surveying this area, it was quite sobering to drill through the ice between my feet and find that it was a whole 20 centimeters thick uh, with four kilometers deep ocean below it. Um, and that was basically just either side of where these guy lines come down to. The thickest point here is only about one meter thick. Um, now, I mentioned that the uh, Fedorov was deploying remote stations. Um, NOAA built three of these um, automatic flux stations that were deployed out at about 15 kilometers away from the ship, uh, roughly in a circle marked by the red, uh, red circles on the little uh, sort of bullseye map around the ship at the center at the bottom there. And these had completely automated system for measuring the mean meteorology, uh, radiative and turbulent fluxes. There's a radio transmitter to send real time data back to the ship, um, an Iridium GPS unit as a sort of fail safe so that we could find the unit again if the, uh, the power failed or if the, uh, the radio system failed. Um, these would power, were powered from um, fuel cells burning methanol, so they were, were clean. The only pollutants from them are water vapor and carbon dioxide. Um, and those needed topping up every about once a month. So somebody had to go out with a helicopter uh, with a, um, and refill the fuel cells, replace the fuel. Um, and these worked really well, except for the one that got completely trashed by a polar bear. Um, we have a number of measurements of remote sensing profiling the atmosphere. So some LIDARs and SODARs, these are instruments that were from Leeds that I took out. This is the SODAR being installed. So this is a phased array SODAR that um, uses beam steering of the acoustic signal off the vertical, and then looks at the Doppler shift um, from which you can recover profiles of the wind speed up to several hundred meters, up to uh, in good conditions, a maximum of about one kilometer. Um, this is a nice sunny view of the meteorological site. Uh, this is well after I had, had come back home. Uh, my colleague Andreas Leg Mended was out there in, um, I guess this is probably May, April or May, something like that. Um, that's another view of the SODAR enclosure. Then we have these Doppler LIDARs. This one is from the University of Trier and is operated on the ship. And this is from the University of Leeds and is out on the ice. Um, it's here wrapped up to try and provide some insulation in the depths of winter to keep it warm. Um, this is, is not really needed when it's operating, but if it loses power, the, the interior, some of the electronics needs to be got up to about plus 10 degrees for it to fire up. So it takes quite a long time and a lot of insulation to reheat it and get it working again if we lost power, which we did on a couple of occasions. In the summer, um, we get a lot of melt. So this is um, out uh, near the, um, well, I guess, actually, I'm not, I think this is probably the second installation when they, after they had had to move things. Uh, but you can see it, it's a, a challenging environment to set up long-term measurements here. Um, another challenge is that everything ices up. So this is a photo of Matt Shoup climbing the mast. Uh, he's got a climbing harness and he's, he's secured at the top of the mast, somebody belaying him. So he can go up and clean ice off all the instruments that needed doing. Um, every so often, probably every, every week or so, enough ice had accumulated to cause problems. Another problem is the ice dynamics. So this is a rather poor photo of my 30 meter mast taken from the ship one night. Um, <clears throat> and you can see there's a kink in the mast, uh, which definitely shouldn't be there. And this lasted for some hours and then it seemed to straighten up again. And uh, the next day it looked fine. And we went out <clears throat> and had a look to see what was going on. And there's a crack in the ice between the base of the tower 
and the first set of guy lines on one side, which had separated by about a meter or so, this lead had opened up and started to pull the, the upper part of the mast over. And then it closed up again and it was fine. And then it opened up again um, the following evening while we were in a meeting discussing whether we wanted to risk leaving it or whether we wanted to move it. And it pulled the whole thing down and trashed it, um, which uh, is, you know, <clears throat> It's a blow, but it's not entirely unexpected for something like this to happen. Um, in the end, everything was salvaged. The instrument, although the sonic anemometer from the top, while it was a little bit bent uh, with a bit of judicious uh, brute force, that was straightened out electronically. It still worked and could be recalibrated. The bent legs on the tripod here, the engineers and the ship sorted out and we lost, I think, seven sections of the mast pipes. So it, it, when we put it back up, uh, it went up to 23 meters instead of 30 meters, but it was working again uh, a few couple of weeks later and then stayed up for a long time. Um, other measurements, uh, these are from RV, we're measured, measuring with a tethered balloon with instrument packages that winched up and down so we can get really high resolution measurements. These are done periodically. Uh, they can't be done in higher winds, but uh, they got a lot of really neat uh, data out of that, which we're looking forward to seeing in the future. Um, this is a wide array of remote sensing measurements of this snow and ice surface. So a lot of the routine measurements and monitoring of um, sea ice is done from satellites. These measurements are all really ground truth for those satellite retrievals. So they are um, getting continuous measurements of known ice surface where nearby you can go out and sample the snow and look at grain structure and depth of accumulated snow and get a core through the ice and measure its properties. So this is trying to get, basically improve the, the retrievals that are used from satellites. Um, these guys had a lot of trouble with, on at least two or three occasions, cracks opening up through their camp and having to go and move all this extraordinarily expensive equipment um, and make sure it didn't just fall in the water. Um, I don't think we lost anything on this expedition like that. I have on a previous expedition, um, but not this time around, fortunately. Uh, then the oceanographic measurements. Uh, the workhorse of most oceanography is the CTD. Um, so this is a CTD cage, that's conductivity, temperature and depth from which you can get water density, temperature structure, salinity structure. The gray bottles, Niskin bottles, are used to get water samples at different depths for chemical and biological analysis. So here, some water samples are being tapped off. Um, a challenge here in the Arctic is that as soon as you pull that CTD out of the water, if the temperature is minus 40, minus 30, um, it's gonna, those water samples are gonna freeze really fast. So to measure this, they had to uh, first make a, a hole in the ice large enough to get the CTD down through. That was a little bit off the ship as far as the, the crane for the CTD could reach. Then they have this cover which is connected to hot air blowers so that when it's brought up and they're getting it sorted out, they can keep the whole thing warm until they can get it pulled on board the ship uh, inside this cover and then brought inside to uh, get all the samples off. A second smaller system was put up in a, a little tent on the ice, uh, so there's a hole drilled through the ice, uh, a, a wooden floor put in over some um, plastic um, barrels effectively that provide both insulation, thermal insulation for inside the tent, makes things a little more comfortable to work, and also flotation in case the ice breaks up or melts through around it. Um, again here, taking off some water samples. Um, <clears throat> somebody peering into, this is one of the holes uh, initially made for deployment of this remotely operated vehicle for making measurements below the ice. So this is another RV instrument. Um, it's um, remotely piloted on a, a two or three hundred meters of cable so it can go and make detailed measurements over quite a wide area underneath the ice. Um, so before I move on to the uh, last sort of set of slides here. I wanted to show some video uh, to give an idea of what it's like trying to work out in some of the uh, 
Jones from the beginning. Um, so this is in pretty strong winds, a lot of blowing snow. Um, the bit you can't quite see, but sort of after the glare of the light, open ring has, has formed up. This is about a meter or a little over a meter of cross, too wide to the jump. And we're, we're making a bridge out of an upturned sled in so that everybody can get across it. Um, there was a period of about two, two weeks where every day we had to find a new route to get out to the meteorological site because yes, these routes had a the leaves cracked in the ice that opened up and we couldn't find our way to get across the country. Sometimes we had to go really very secure. set off um, and here just waiting to make sure that colleagues who are following know what the, uh, the situation is. Okay. Back to the slides. Um, so one of the things that is required when trying to do measurements like this is we can just think about the, the everybody's sort of thinking about their own individual science and what they need to do, but it requires a lot of logistics. Um, power is needed at all these sites. We need to get data back. A lot of the, the sensors that are working out, things like my LIDAR and SODAR at the meteorological Met City site, um, in order to get the, the data back and make sure things are working, we need a network connection to them. So there are fiber optic network cables are run out along these stands. The orange cables are the main power cables. Uh, we've run out, installed several kilometers um, of power cable like this, which is really pretty heavy, hard work to drag out, um, put up on these tripods, which are easily moved or replaced. <coughs> um, and this is around the ship. So they're all connected to the ship and they run out along uh, just on the right hand side where you can see these black markers, these are uh, parked up skidoos. The main power cable runs out out along there. Um, this is something that's very expensive to do. I, I said right at the start that a major stumbling block was getting somebody to commit to providing the platform, the ship for a whole year. The logistics cost for Mosaic, before you inc include any science at all, was 200,000 euros per day. It was, it is extortionately expensive to run something like this. Um, then we have the challenges of things. This is opened up during the uh, early part of leg one, this um, crack in the ice right next to the ship, uh, which meant that once we come down the gangplank, you suddenly got open water to get across before anybody can get to any of their instruments. Um, so there's a little bridge was installed there that's actually closed up a little bit but um, <clears throat> uh, as this opened up the, originally the skidoos were parked out near the ship here and the crack opened up right underneath one of the skidoos having some of the logistics people racing out to get it fired up and moved before it uh, the crack opened wide enough that it would fall in and sink. Um, this is another crack that opened up near the oceanography hut. Um, so this, when this opened up, I was actually acting as a bear guard out there. Um, and the, the two parts of the ice, they were moving relative to each other at um, probably a few centimeters per second. And then they'd stop and then it would start moving again. And you just um, watching everything move around you. It's quite a strange experience. And um, also remarkably noisy the, as the ice moves against itself. It's, it makes a lot of, of noise. This is the aftermath of that crack where the cables have got churned up with the ice has come together and formed a ridge and broken up. And now the cables are jammed underneath it. Um, we're trying to extract them here. Um, in times that was impossible and they had to be cut and then rejoined. So we had to get the electricians out to do that. Uh, it, maintaining the logistics was a, a really significant challenge. Um, <clears throat> and maintaining safety is, of course, a priority. So um, polar bears are an ever-present possibility. We had at 
least one visit per week while I was out there of bears. Um, and so there was a bunch of guys who are there as professional bear guards. These are mostly people who um, live and work up um, in Svalbard and act as tour guides for mountaineering expeditions up there. Um, all very experienced at dealing with Arctic conditions, Arctic survival and polar bear safety. But also there's not enough of them to do all the guarding. So all the scientists, if you didn't have anything else to do at a particular time, um, we're all asked to volunteer. We'd all got had um, training, um, marksman training. We had to go for a day's firearms training with uh, before joining the expedition and refreshers once we were out there. Um, and I did quite a lot of this because most of my instrumentation runs automatically. If it's working well, there's not actually a lot for me to do with it uh, once it's running. So I ended up doing quite a bit of bear guarding, which was I really enjoyed. It's it's one of the few times where you can actually get to be really on your own, away from other people. That you've got an area you're sort of patrolling and keeping an eye out, and being out on the on the ice. Uh, this was the first my first time doing it over winter. Um, is is really uh, something I enjoyed immensely. It's it's a really beautiful place to be, um, and it's. Um, a really great experience to be out in that in at times nobody around if you were on one of the more remote sites it's silent you can't hear the ship um, it's really fun um, and this is what we are guarding against so this is a mother and cub that came up uh, one evening um, they are interested in everything they are really inquisitive creatures uh, in particular, anything brightly coloured, they, they seem to really go for anything orange or red. Uh, they always do a lot of the, the sites, they have these uh, orange dome tents uh, are used quite a lot. Um, and they always want to get in there and see. So you, you need some protection. They put little electric fences around the tents to keep the bears out or to try and scare them off. Um, but as long as you're reasonably cautious, um, they are, they're, they're not a huge danger as long as they're not desperately hungry and you maintain your distance. Um, I've encountered them a number of times and never felt threatened by them. And it's a real privilege to get to see them uh, in the wild like that. So that is my time up. Uh, I'll leave a photograph here. This is the science team from Leg One, uh, which is so, you know, 60, 70 people. Um, and it is a huge collaborative effort to do something like this. It's very difficult to um, do a major Arctic expedition. Um, it needs a huge amount of collaboration um, and is ultimately, um, it's a huge amount of work. Uh, everybody's working not quite around the clock, but um, very long hours, but it is also an enormous amount of fun. So with that, I will take uh, uh, questions. It was great talk and some great pictures as well. Um, we have quite a few questions, so I'll just... Um, so, um, okay, I go down here. What are, what are the extremes of temperature and wind during the campaign? Um, the warmest temperatures when we started were close to uh, probably about minus five to minus 10. It was already into the start of the, the freeze up. Um, the coldest while I was out there got down to close to minus 30 and the lowest temperatures they got during the campaign were about minus 40. Um, and this is a little different to other places. The, the fact that you're on sea ice limits how low the temperature can get because of the heat flux from the ocean, which it can't get. The coldest the ocean water can get is minus 1.8 freezing point of salt water. Um, and there is enough of a heat flux conducted through the ice that it is impossible to get a temperature lower than about minus 45 if you're over sea ice. In contrast, if you're up like somewhere, I have a PhD student who overwintered this year at Greenland Summit, and she had temperatures down to minus 65, which is a whole other ball game. Um, and it is it is quite dramatic. I've, I've done summer expeditions before where we've got down to maybe minus 15. Um, working at around freezing, that's fine. 
no problem. I mean, it's it's uncomfortable doing small nuts and bolts and things handling metal, but it's not too much of a problem. Minus 15 becomes a whole other game that it's much colder, much, much harder work. Um, minus 25 is again, you know, it's a whole other ball game again. Things become very, very much more difficult. Cables just become really stiff. And I, I was trying to wrestle the cable for the sodar. I had to change the, uh, the signal processing unit that we were using and re put new cables on and just they're like springs they become so stiff and just trying to bend it into place to get the the plug into the socket on the sodar half of the about a, a, a half meter long section of the plastic insulation on the cable just shattered off um that becomes a real real challenge you do sort of get used to it so when we started and we're, we're putting out all the power cables and it was sort of minus 15 you'd think was a pretty cold day and that was pretty grim and by the time we finished in the middle of winter um, if it was minus 20 and low wind you'd go oh, that's quite a nice day that's all right um, so and it with all, you dress properly you know, I was I was never cold working out there um, occasionally when you're working hard you can get the problem is actually overheating and getting too sweaty inside all those clothes um, and then as soon as you stop and come inside you you start to get cold with that but um you've got enough enough layers on hopefully that um you survive that um, got, um <coughs> quite a few questions oh, uh, earlier in the chat in the chat which i can bring up in the order that they were asked okay. um, <coughs> quite a few we might have to go through them quickly but um john asks how do you stop emissions from the ship impacting the Oh, that's a real. Basically, you can't, there are always going to be emissions from the ship. Um, it's 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 fossil fuel powered. It's burning. I mean, the en main engines aren't running while we're just moored to the ice. It's just a auxiliaries to keep the the power. And but they are burning. I think it was fifteen um, fifteen tons of diesel a day. Um, the, there's not nothing you can do to potentially stop them impacting measurements. They're, they're a real problem for gas chemistry and aerosol measurements. The only thing you can really do is um, have either control systems that shut down sampling if the wind is in such a direction that you are going to be sampling the ship's exhaust plume, or for a lot of the online measurements, you just do that filtering with the data afterwards, you, you've got measurements of um, tracers for pollution. So carbon monoxide is a good tracer for the burning. Um, so that's used, if that is elevated, then you're sampling pollution and can junk that bit of data. <coughs> um, Great, that's also answered somebody else's question who asked um, if the ship was powered by fossil fuel or nuclear. So yeah, it's fossil fueled, that. yes. Um, um, so the next oh sorry uh, the, then, next, the next question was um how did the sonic the animometers sonic anemometers, the snow and ice um, conditions the sonic anemometers coped very well because we used ones from a, a german company called metec which are the only company that make sonic anemometers with heated heads so they are uh, a metal uh, construction that is heated and that keeps them completely ice free so we, we did not have any problems with ice in those um, every other sonic anemometer you might use the, the Campbell and Gill ones are very commonly used um, they ice up terribly um, if you're if you're doing this turbulence flux measurements in the Arctic Metec sonic anemometer is the one you want it is also a Metec Animators at the top of the 30 meter mast and got smashed into the uh, ice when the mast came down. And I managed to just, although it got pretty bent, I could straighten everything out, remeasure all the path lengths, recalibrate it, got it working again. Um, so they they make very robust instruments. They are <clears throat> very impressive. I'll bear that in mind next time I'm buying an animometer. Um, 
due to rising Arctic temperatures, is there any evidence of increasing amounts of snowfall in the winter? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure about the answer to that one. Um, it's there is a, a fair amount of snowfall anyway. It's not as much as in the Antarctic, where uh, over sea ice you've got you've always got marine air um, coming in, which is always going to be warmer and moister. So we'll always be able to generate snow. In the Arctic, a lot depends on where the air mass has come from. If it if it's come from over continental land mass, it's probably lost most of the, its moisture anyway. Um, so we, we didn't get huge amounts of, of snow. We got a few events that deposited um, and in, in a few inches. Drifting is what actually generates areas of deeper snow rather than high rates of snowfall. <clears throat> Uh, about about the teamwork. The first one is about the intentions of the Russian team on the targets versus yours. <coughs> and then there's also oh, a question about sharing data um, and how like the different experiments implementation. Yeah. So the first of those, uh, so you missed the bit. The, the Russian team, the Russians were providing a lot of logistic support in terms of the um, ferrying people in and out uh, for team team exchanges every couple of months um, and they um, were doing a, a lot of that because they have very good icebreakers and a huge amount of experience um, they really really know what they're doing um, navigating in the ice the it, what the initial uh, application for the uh, Russian team was to um, do the installation of all the distributed measurements away from the polar stern so there was a rings of measurements out to about 50 kilometers away from the ship which were relatively simple boys so they were put in gps boys to measure the ice deformation there were three at 15 kilometers there were three remote uh, energy uh, there were also some oceanographic boys who have tethered measurement systems on the underside um, so they spent two weeks racing around um, with the ship and helicopter installing these remote sites um, and then um, they had some additional people that joined the polar stern so we were actually for the the two weeks of the main installation there were people doubled up so we they would actually got more people on the ship than it could hold so there were, were people uh, sleeping on sofas in cabins where you've got three people in a two-person cabin um, <coughs> So that that's demonstrates quite a bit of dedication, but that, it, that's for a relatively short period. And then there were we ended up with I think the the science team was about um, sixty, the logistics support about ten people, and there's about twenty five on the crew, maybe thirty. So we, we've got a about a hundred of people on the ship um, for the rest of the time. <clears throat> And then data sharing is hugely important. Everybody's got their own pet data things, what we want. Um, so there is a big archive, uh, the Pangea archive uh, run in Germany, which is used a lot for polar um, data from European projects. That's the, the nominated archive for Mosaic. Um, by signing up, anybody doing mosaic science basically signs up to share all their data with everybody else on the project. And anybody using the data signs up to various data agreements that they have to, you know, if you're using somebody else's data, you have to keep them well informed, you have to offer them co authorship on papers and so on. Um, and that's great. I mean, it's clear even just within the atmospheric science team, we, we have monthly meetings. Um, and we're starting to go through various people's data and you, you can immediately see things that people are going, oh yeah, I could use that and find connections. And then there will, will be a lot of those, particularly with um, the oceanography, we'd have links with and with um, some of the biogeochemistry and sea ice processes. Um, 
whether and there's a question whether Russian experiments fully part of mosaic. Yes, um, they're fully involved. Um, there were a team of um, there's a two or three Russian guys on leg one on the ship. They were they were um, mostly that team was a lot involved with a lot of the sea ice sampling, um, and they were worked very hard to get a lot of ice cores for. Um, various both chemistry and biological sampling um, and it's interesting to see the way different science areas work so the the, the guys working with um, sort of the, um, biogeochemistry ice properties who want ice cores and then are looking at the chemistry of the ice water and what biology what microbes are living in there and so on they're all focused around sampling so they go out they had one day a week when they went out and took all these ice cores and various sites and they did a very long day um, working very intensely and then they bring all that back and then they've got loads of lab work to do um, <coughs> and similarly for the ocean sampling they'd have a day when they they did all the the, the real sort of deep ctd cast and getting all these uh, water samples and then lots and lots of lab work so what, uh, after a sampling day they would be working 18 hour days in the lab trying to keep up with all the analysis um, and and to some extent failing it's, it's you know samples are coming in faster than you can really handle them whereas a lot of the atmospheric science stuff it's all automated measurements the instruments just run and collect data and as long as everything's working smoothly there's not that much to actively do you go out every day check everything's but mostly we would manage with with two hours on site every day so we'd go out nine o'clock in the morning we'd come back at uh, 11 30 for lunch and then unless anything was wrong and needed fixing then that was probably it for the on-site at met city for the day and then we could get on with sort of data analysis checking things um <clears throat> and so on um and it, it, was, it was the guy that i shared a cabin with uh, it was for the part of the ice ecology team um and i i was sort of thinking like you, you're crazy you're going you know out all day doing all these samples and then long hours in the lab I, I can lie in my bunk and sample you know check that most of my instruments are still working and he he just said yeah but i'm not crazy enough to put a 30 meter mast up on unstable sea ice that was a week or two before there's the crazy it, people in, in every area of science they all think the other one's crazy yeah that's true we all think everyone else is crazy and yeah <laughs> doing it. Um, um but it's great i mean it's Sorry, I was just it's fantastic to work with, with a, a wide range of people like that that you and it's a very special environment do any work at sea on a ship because you're just all in a you know fairly closed up tin can you're living very very closely together sharing cabins <clears throat> you can't get away from other people you've got to get on well um and on the whole people do i think uh, the people who do lots of field work are um particular personalities who tend to get on well with other people which generally makes it a really fun way of working i've always had that experience as well doing field work um unfortunately we are at the end of our time now um so i think we'll have to call it a day there but um that was a really interesting insight okay. into field work just in the Arctic. before we leave i just i'm just putting into the chat a big list of links to various online resources that might interest people. So there's the, the main Mosaic uh, public site is listed there. There's a couple of video documentaries um, which are interesting. There's one that was done by uh, Noah, which is a, about a 20, 30 minute documentary, which is a, a, a 2D cut of a, what was done as a, a 360 degree filming for a planetarium show. Uh, there's a, a big documentary that RV made. So they had a film crew out throughout the whole expedition documenting it. Um, there's a, a German language documentary linked there on YouTube. I believe there should be an English language version coming out at some point. Um, they have a lot of other videos up there, much shorter ones of various types. And there's also quite a neat um, photographic book uh that there was um rvs of a photographer esther horvath who is a 
a photographer for things like National Geographic, who was out on leg one, um, and she's got a, a really beautiful book of photographs. I've, I've put the Amazon link for it there, but go go buy it from an independent bookstore instead. Um, Afterwards, um, feel free to get in touch with us at the Yorkshire Local Centre. Um, and also, if you do have any more questions for Ian that we've not managed to get through this evening, then um, I'll put our um, contact details on there and you can sign up to the mailing list as well so you can um, hear about upcoming talks. And like I mentioned at the beginning, this one's going to be on YouTube uh, in the next few days. So if you have any, um, well, if you want to see all those great pictures again, uh, that's an option. Um, and um our, sorry i think this might be a bit not quite the right slide there but our next talk is actually uh, on uh, the 12th of may i believe um which is um, alexis percival who's the environmental and sustainability manager of the Management service uh, and she's going to be talking about health and climate change it's a bit different to what we've seen this evening but hopefully lots of you will be able to join us then um, I think that's everything for me. So I'd just like to say thanks again, Ian, for a great talk. Um, a pleasure. And, thank you for having me. Yeah, and thanks everyone for coming. And we hope to see you all again soon. <clears throat>